Thank you, Sister Cheryl. That was such a blessing, such a blessing. What a beautiful voice the Lord has given you. Give a hand to Sister Cheryl. We thank God for you. I have heard her sing in Sister Dorothy's meetings. You know, we are having a very special speaker in our midst. She's not a guest. She is with us for the past 10 plus years. God has blessed the Potter's Ministries with a wonderful set of board of directors. And you know what they do? They are prayer warriors. They pray for this ministry. And we thank God for that. And they take godly decisions for this ministry. You know, so many lives are being touched every day through this ministry. It's like a ladder. That's what God has always shown me. This ministry has been like a ladder where, where the heavenly blessings just flow down and the people of God can lay up treasures in heaven for them. And it's only God who has given us such committed board members. You know, um, she has been very faithfully serving the Lord. The first time I met her was in the year 1999 when I went to Jubilee Christian Center with my husband and I. Back then, there were not many Indians here. So there was a time when Pastor Dick Burnell said, all the intercessory prayer team come up and Sister Dorothy just ran up there and I heard her pray for the first time. And I said, I should someday know people like that because God was talking to us to start this ministry in that year, and we launched the Potter's Ministries in the year 2000, my husband and I. And we always wanted people who are mature believers, who have seen that and done that in the work of God, because we were like, you know, we didn't have much experience, you know. We were like the new lad in the block, and God wants us to start a ministry. God, I told the Lord, and my husband and I, we fasted and prayed, Lord, give us people that really love you, the faithful people. And after seven years, long story short, God gave us Sister Dorothy Daniels. Give her a hand and let's welcome our sister. She's an intercessor. She's the founder and president of International New Wave Ministries that does the work of God. You know, the Bible says people that are planted in the house of the Lord they will flourish, and even in their old age, they will bear fruit. So let's be in that attitude of expectation. God is going to use her to speak to us. We are going to hear the voice within that voice. Give another hand for our sister, Sister Dorothy Daniels. Well, thank the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. It is my privilege and my pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, Jemima says some really nice things. I don't know if that's really me. <laughs> but I can tell you this, I do love the Lord. I was born again in 1965. Been in church all my life. Hated it. <laughs> as a young woman, as a young child growing up, that's all we could do was go to church. And so I didn't like that at all. And I'm sure... Some of you younger people will understand that. But as I grew older, got married, began to have children, and life responsibilities began to hit me, and all I began to remember things that happened in my earlier childhood. I was in my 20s, and I began to cry out for salvation. I began to realize I couldn't live this life by myself. I needed help. And I had been taught that Jesus Christ was my only help. And I became born again in 1965. So I've been walking this walk for quite a long time. And as I stand here this morning, I really don't know um, what to tell you, what to talk about. But um, when I was in New Zealand, I had a meeting with a group of ladies. And it wasn't a church meeting. It was just a meeting in their home where we got together and shared some food and all. And 
they wanted me to talk to them and I began to talk to them and tell them some things about this God I serve. And one of the ladies said to me later on in another meeting, she said to me, Sister Dorothy, would you tell us some of your stories? <laughs> and so I thought, I guess they are stories, stories of what God has done, not only in my life, but in the lives of so many other people. So I have many, many stories. I mean, I could go on and on and on about the story. So I think today what I will do is tell you some stories. So Father, in the name of Jesus, here we stand. We give you thanks, O oh God, for your loving kindness and your tender mercy. You've blessed us once again to see another Palm Sunday, my Lord. And Lord, we don't take it for granted. We thank you, Holy Father, for blessing us to stand here in the presence of your people. And Lord God, in the name of Jesus, we say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Holy Spirit, we thank you and we ask you to help us today. We've learned a long time ago we can't do this by ourselves. Only you know, Lord, what the people sitting before me need. Father God, as their faces differ, so do their needs. But we thank you that you are a God that can meet ho -ho, every need, and you can meet it simultaneously. You are that kind of God. And we praise you, and we give you glory, and we give you honor. And we say, Holy Spirit, have your way this morning in this place, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You know, I love the Lord. And I don't know anything I enjoy better than talking about him, telling people about him. Today is Palm Sunday, the beginning of the Passion Week, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem sitting on the donkey and the people took their coats off and they cut down palm branches and they put them all so that he could ride on them. The donkey had to walk on them. And they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The word Hosanna means save now. And that's what we need as it still is way back then, that's what they needed. And we still need salvation today. The only thing was those people were looking for a savior that would save them politically and free them nationally. But Jesus had come to save them spiritually. Yeah. First things first. Because if we get saved spiritually, everything else falls in place. Our primary needs are met. Our political and cultural needs are met. Salvation is met if we get saved spiritually. And thank God. I believe that all of us sitting in this room have received a spiritual salvation. But many of us are not living up to where God wants us to live in that spiritual salvation. You know, I, I, all my life I've been taught about prayer. My mother was an intercessor. And people that around me were intercessors. But my mother was an intercessor that prayed all day the time. Sometimes I'd go into her bedroom, wanted to talk to her, and she was on her knees. I'd go back 15 minutes later, and she was still on her knees. But let me tell you how my mother was. My mother was an intercessor, and so we learned about prayer. She took us to church. She taught us about God. She read us the scripture. But when my mother would get angry, I don't know where the intercessor went, because my mother would cuss my daddy out. She would jump on and fight my dad. I remember one, one night, my dad went out. My dad played music and my mother sang. My dad was a musician. 
So he liked to go out in the clubs and play his guitar and all those things. My dad come home one night, oh, about 2 o'clock in the morning, and my mother could hear him out the window. And we children, we were sleeping. And uh, my mom got the gun, and she could hear the people in the car with my dad, and she just opened the window and began to shoot. But she was an inter intercessor. Okay, time went on, and I remember one night my dad came home. He came home really late, and my mom is angry because he's been out and, and neglecting the family and doing all the things he was doing. And I looked up, and my mom had an ice pick in her hand. And when my dad walked in the door, she stuck that ice pick all the way through his arm. But my mom was an intercessor. I remember one time my mom and my dad got to arguing and my dad, my mom accused my, my dad of uh, being unfaithful and this lady came to our house. <laughs> and they, we, my mother and my father and some of the relatives was around and my mom saw this lady walking up to, her, to our house and she came in the house and my mom knew that this lady and my dad had been having some things together that they weren't supposed to be doing and my mom jumped up and got on this lady and it took three men to hold my mom off this one woman. But my mom was an intercessor. But you see, my mom had not been taught many things that the Bible teach us about this spiritual living. I love my mom, I love my dad, and my mom taught us the best that she knew how. My mom loved the Lord, and I believe today that my mother's resting in heaven with Jesus because Jesus is a forgiving God. And we don't grow into this intimacy with God overnight. It's a lifetime process. And I've seen my mom change down through the years. I've seen her life change to becoming a humble woman. As I got old, and I'm in my 50s and 60s years old, my sister and I said, is this mama? This is not the mama we knew. So I have other siblings. I'm the eldest of nine children. So I have a sisters and brothers that are much 30, 40 years younger than me. And we tell them all the time, the mother that raised you is not the mother that, ra <laughs> that raised us. She loved the Lord, yes. So I want to tell you today, I believe that even though my mom did the things she did as she was a young woman growing into her marriage, I believe God forgave her. I believe God heard every one of her prayers. And I want to tell you today, you do not have to be perfect for God to hear you when you pray. I want to tell you today, just don't, huh, just don't stop praying. Just don't give up on God because he's never going to give up on you. I've seen my mother, the way she lived as a young woman, but I saw how God changed her in her latter years. I've seen how God salvation came in more and more and more. We grow in this life. We're not perfect. Thank God that he came to give us a spiritual salvation. And I just want to tell you some stories about my life. I thought about talking about the five levels of intercession. See, my mother was an intercessor, but she was on the, she never got to the fifth level of intercession when I was living in the house with her. That came much later. When I first gave my life to the Lord, became born again, I was in the Baptist church, and I was so overjoyed that God saved me. And I went to this church. I got saved in my home. God came into my house after praying and praying and praying because I wanted to know this God that I've been talk, taught about all my life. And I began to cry out for God to save me. And God saved me. In my bed, I was sleeping one morning when I woke up. And when I woke up, my heart felt like it was going pulsating. And I heard, you're alive, you're alive, you're alive, you're alive. And I, I got up and I said, I got it. I'm saved. I'm saved. And I got up and I went to the window and I looked out the window. 
for the first time I heard the voice of the Lord and he said, go look out the window. And I went and looked out the window. And it was uh, just before day. It wasn't quite daylight. Just before the night ends and the day begins. And I saw this one star up in the sky. And I said, God, if you have really saved me, put that star out. And as I stood there in my window looking, the star went out just like somebody swept a light switch. And I said, I got it. I got it. I've been praying for this for weeks. I got it. And then I heard that same voice say, go look out the other window. And I went and I looked out the window across the hall out the other bedroom. My brother was in that room sleeping. And I looked out that window and I saw a ray of light. It looked like a rainbow, but it had no colors in it, just beautiful. And it was glowing, it was shining. And I was just looking at this light, it was amazing. And I woke my brother up and I said, look at this light, look at this light. He said, what's wrong with you? I don't see no light. And that's when I learned that God show you things that nobody see but you. It's only for you. And as I began to grow in the Lord, uh, I'd been saved maybe two months. And the mother of the church, she said, we need a, someone to lead the noonday prayer meeting. And Sister Dorothy, would you do it? I don't know how to pray. I just got saved. Lead a prayer, leading other people into prayer. I don't even know how to do this myself. I'm just coming here because I just got to know the Lord and I wanted to learn how to pray. So I end up, in my first few weeks of salvation, leading a prayer meeting. And that's where I learned all about prayer. I began to pray every day faithfully. My excuse for, to her was, I can't do this because I've got my children. I can't do this because I've got other things to do. But I was a housewife. I, didn't, I wasn't working. So she said to me, Sister Dorothy, where there's a will, there is a way. And so I knew that was the voice of the Lord, even though I just got saved. You know when God speaks. So I said, okay, and I would go every day to this Baptist church. A Baptist church held about 700 people. But nobody was there during the daytime to pray. Me and my children, one or two other ladies came, and when they found out I was leading the prayer meeting, they stopped coming too. So I found out as time went on, that was for me, because during those times when I learned to hear the voice of the Lord, I learned to read the Bible, because I would pray for half an hour, and I would read for half an hour. After several months, God sent another lady there with me, and she became my mentor. Her name was Margaret Hunter. I love her dearly. She's gone on with the Lord now, and she would encourage me to keep on, keep on. Just don't stop, keep on coming, keep on coming. And I went there faithfully every day praying for my family's salvation because this salvation that I had received was so good. I wanted all my family and all my friends to get it. I remember writing letters to my relatives in Louisiana and all over the place to tell them about this salvation that I got, telling all my family and all my friends about this salvation that I had received. And I would go there on that altar every day and I would pray for them. I would pray for their salvation. And maybe several years passed, two or three years passed, and one by one, my sister got saved. Then my other sister got saved. That's nine of us. And you know, God brought us all into the kingdom just from coming to noonday prayer every day. Not only was he saving my family, but he was teaching me all about this God that we serve. You see, we don't get to know him until we spend time with him. It's one thing to pray with groups of people, and it's one thing to pray with, with prayer meetings and all that. That's good, and that's necessary. But we really don't get to know God that way. We get to know God by spending time with him all by ourselves. We get to know his love. We get to know his kindness. We get to know how he treats us. We get to know that he really do love us. We begin to pull off the religious stuff because many times those of us that are in church, we're full of religion. We're doing things for God, but that are not of God. 
We're doing them just because they're religious things to do, and that's what we should do, and that's what we want to do. But God has never said, this is what I want you to do. We do them just because this is what Christian people do. It was during those times that I learned to seek the Lord with all of my heart and find out what it is you want me to do before I step out. So as time went on, I just kept on praying, kept on praying. And I remember this time. Because I thought praying was just nothing. It's just something to do. Uh, I, I see the preachers preach. I saw the people evangelize. Uh, doing all these great things, but all I was doing was praying. All I did was pray. And I saw people doing all kind of great things. And I thought all I do is pray. And I remember the time came when God, you see, we become what we pray. I remember just praying. I was in the Baptist church and I asked the pastor, could I have a Saturday night prayer meeting? They refused. No, because always an excuse. I wanted to pray on Saturday nights because I had been to the Saturday night prayer meeting and there was only two or three people coming. That doesn't bother me. The, the number of people doesn't bother me. But they were unfaithful. The leader would come some Saturday, sometime they weren't there, blah, blah, blah. So I said, Pastor, could I do it? Because two or three Saturdays I went, nobody was there. So I said, well, Pastor, could I do it? And no, he wouldn't let me do it. That was okay. I just went home and kept on praying. I said, God, if this is really you putting this in my heart to do this, then, you know, touch his heart. Well, God never touched his heart, but I was just starting to go to Bible college at Jubilee Christian Center back in 1983. And so the, the leader of the children's ministry called me up and asked me if I would come and teach the children on Sunday mornings. Well, I'm still in the Baptist church, but I'm going to that church, to their Bible college. So I said yes, and that's how I got to Jemima. That's how I got to Jubilee Christian Center. I've never joined the church. I've never became a member of the church. My first Sunday in that church, I was teaching the children in the children's church. Eventually, they found out that I was a person of prayer because I would go there during the daytime and pray. And they asked me to pray for the pastor one week while he was going to India, one week before he left, two weeks before he left, two weeks while he was there, and two weeks after he came back. And that's how I became the intercessor for a church of over 10,000 members. We become what we pray. My sister joined that church. And after we joined the church, we looked around, and that was mostly Caucasian people, maybe one or two black people, and like your mama said, one or two Indian people, but mostly all Caucasian people. And so I began to pray, Lord, will you put some color in this church? Lord, put some color in this church. And my sister and I began to pray for God to add some color to the church. It was too white. <laughs> and so as we looked around, several years later, and Jemima is my witness, there is everything in that church. Every nationality under the sun is in that church. You see, we thought God was going to send more black people. But God sent Indian people, Hawaiian people, Filipino people. People of all different colors and nationalities. I began to see God does answer prayer. But all the time the devil is telling me all you ever do is pray. And I, I remember the time when God spoke to me and he says, what do you see? I'm in the prayer room, in the prayer meeting. 
And I say, well, I see these people here, and I see the walls, and there's not much else in this room to see. And I said, that's all I see, Lord. I said, he said, that's not what I see. I said, well, Lord, what do you see? He said, I see the multitude waiting to hear what you've got to say. And I said, but Lord, I don't see that. He said, that's what I see. He said, go buy yourself a good set of luggage because I'm going to send you to the multitudes. I had that luggage for maybe six or eight months in my garage. I, I, I was obedient to the Lord. I went and bought the luggage, put it in my garage. One weekend, we went to a conference in Santanella, California. There were some people there doing a conference, and the conference was wonderful. And this young man that was doing the praise and worship announced that he was going to Guam. I had a girlfriend there that was in the conference with me who had children in Guam. And she said, Dorothy, they're going to Guam. Let's go to Guam with them. I said, girl, I don't know nothing about Guam. She said, I believe God is telling us to go to Guam. My children are there. We don't have to worry about a place to live. We don't have to pay for a hotel or anything. My children are there. So I said, oh, when are, when are they going? December? December? Oh, no, that's a holiday. Mm -mm. But it was before Christmas. It was December, the first part of December. So I said, I'll pray about it. And, you know, we, we use that as an excuse sometimes when we say a no. <laughs> we don't really want to do it, but we always say we'll pray about it. Well, I actually did go pray about it. And I heard the Lord say, didn't I tell you to buy a good set of luggage? And I knew then I was supposed to go to Guam. So. About a week later, I was in a women's ministry meeting, and this lady walked up to me, and she said, Dorothy, I heard you're going to Guam. I said, yeah, God willing. She said, well, what are you doing after the meeting? I said, nothing. She says, well, come, let's go to lunch. So we went to lunch. She had some other errands to run, and we, I did that with her. Her last errand, she went to a travel agency. She said, come on in with me. That woman took me in that travel agency and paid for my ticket round trip to Guam. But the devil kept telling me, all you do is pray. Our prayers mean much to God. And that was my first trip outside of the United States.
be like six or eight people. My girlfriend that I went with, she had took off and went to the Philippines. And she said, Dorothy, come on, go to the Philippines with me. I said, you know, God didn't tell me to go to the Philippines. <laughs> I said, I believe God sent me to Guam. I said, I'm going home on Monday. This was Saturday night. She said, well, I'm going to the Philippines. You should come and go with me. I said, no, I'm not going to the Philippines. So she took off and left me. So here I am there with her son in a place I don't know nobody. But that Saturday night, the lady from the church came to the house and picked me up. And she took me to the church for intercessory prayer. That's where I found out why I was there. We went into the church for intercessory prayer, but maybe about five or six people there in the prayer meeting. And we began to pray. And I believe when we pray, we need to have a goal that we're praying for. What are we praying for? So we're praying for the church. We're praying for the pastor. We're praying for the island of Guam. So that's that was my focus. That was, that's what I began to pray for. And as, as I began to pray, tears began to run down my face. My nose began to run. I'm crying out to God. I'm in intercession. I'm in travail. How many of you know what I mean? Some, some Christian people have never travailed. I was in travail. I'm moaning and groaning. I do not have words anymore to say. I'm just, ugh and just grown it as if I'm having a baby. Though your women know what, that, what, that, what that's like. Okay. That was no tissue. That was nothing to wipe my nose with. And I didn't have any. So I'm thinking, oh my God. These people, prayer people, most of the time you go to a prayer meeting, you always take tissue because somebody's going to start crying. Because when the Spirit of God come up on you, something happens. So anyway, I'm taking my clothes. <laughs> I go back to the house where I was living. That, that Monday, I came home, got home that afternoon. I got a phone call after I was home, maybe about two hours. A friend of mine called, and she says, Dorothy, you're home. I said, yes, I just got here today. She said, I was just calling to see if you was home. Have you heard the news? I said, no, I have not. What, what is the news? She said, a typhoon hit Guam. She said, and it's so bad, it's not, it's, not, it's not even on the news yet, it's on the internet. She said, I saw it on the internet. It hit China, it hit Japan, it came all the way down through there. 270 miles an hour winds. I have it written out, I have the papers. I kept them for the glory of God. But when that storm, oh, oh, when that storm hit Guam, it was like the Holy Spirit said, not here. And it just passed Guam by. Pe houses were destroyed, people were killed, but not Guam. Why? Because somebody, God had sent me to Guam just to pray. Not to preach no sermons, not to do no great evangelism, but to pray for the people, to pray for that island. And I want to encourage you that are intercessors, those of you that pray, don't stop praying. Because if God needs somebody to pray and there's no one there, he'll pick you. And I said to Guam, I was, it, 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 it puzzled me. I said to God, why did you send me over there? Why did you send me over there to pray? And the book, it said, I looked for an intercessor, but I found none. You know the scripture. I sought for an intercessor. And I used to quote that scripture all the time. I sought for an intercessor, but I found none. And God said, go back and read it again. And I went back to that scripture and I read it. And it says, I sought for an intercessor among them. But I found none. It don't just say I sought for an intercessor. It says, I sought for an intercessor among them. So God had to send somebody among them. Jesus came down and he was here amongst us. And he didn't come just to heal blind eyes, 
raise up crippled bodies and to raise the dead. But he came as an intercessor. His primary function that he came to this earth for was to intercede because out of intercession comes healing. And I, I don't know how many people God have used me in healing. Went in the church and God said, pray for that lady over there in the wheelchair. Pray for the lady in the wheelchair. The next day my pastor friend called and said, no, that lady you prayed for in the wheelchair said she's up doing fine now. I prayed for a lady, another lady, multiple sclerosis. I just prayed and left. She had multiple sclerosis, and her sister had, uh, had just got out of surgery from a gallbladder surgery, but she was pushing her around in the chair. And we went to her house, and I said, can I pray for you? And she says, well, we're Catholics. I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian. I said, but it's only one God. I said, you believe in God? She said, yes. I said, well, the same God, the Catholic, the same God of, that I serve. So she let me pray for her. A few days later, my mom went back to the house because she was looking for a house to purchase, and that house was for sale. My mom called me up, and she said, Dorothy, you know those two ladies you prayed for? I said, yeah. She said, they're both up and doing fine now. She said, they told me to call you and tell you never stop doing what you do. They had been to the Vatican. They got holy oil. They got holy water and all that. None of that worked. One prayer from this little black woman didn't even lay hands on them, just stood over the wheelchair and prayed. Never let the devil th tell you all you do is pray. Because when Jesus came, he didn't come just to heal people. He came for the salvation of our souls. And he died and he went to the cross for that so that we could be saved. I just want to tell you those couple of little stories and I want to tell you something just recent. These happened years ago. But just last week, I went to a conference in Fresno. We are special to God. God sees us as special. You know, the world sees us as those Christians, those fanatics, whatever. But God sees us as his children, and he loves us. Went to a conference down there. It was called the Altar Conference. I didn't know it was going to be such a huge conference. There must have been about 50, 60,000 people there. It was at the Save Mart Center in Fresno. I've never been there. I thought it was just going to be in a little shopping center where they rent the building and they have the conference. Well, when I got there, we went in the building because you had to go and get your... I, you get your um, your packet and all that. We went and did that, went, went back to the hotel. And when we came back to go into the building, there was people wrapped all around that building. Three different entrances and all of them were packed. And I said, oh my goodness, I'm walking up here with my cane. And I said, oh, I can't stand in those lines like that. I said, that is too much. And then once you get up to the door is, you have to open your purse. They search your purse. They scan you, just like going to the airport. And I thought, oh, my God. And I said to the girl that drove me down there, I said, I can't stand in that line. And my granddaughter met us there who lives in that area. So she stood in line for me. <laughs> Thank God for young people. <laughs> she, she stood in line for me. And as they got closer, and thank God for cell phones and this modern technology. And she would call me to let me know how far up she is. And when she got almost to the door, she called me. And I went up to meet them with my cane. I'm hobbling along with my cane. And there were also other people with walkers and canes and crutches. And I said, wow, they made no provisions for the handicapped people. And, but this was the first time this had ever been done in Fresno. First time they'd ever had a Christian meeting that size in that city. And you know, when you're an intercessor, God will cause you to be the first of many things. Especially when he wants to carry the thing on and on. He'll cause you to be among the first. Because that's the 
uh, the anointing of an apostle. And there's no way you can be an intercessor with God and you don't have those anointings on you. Anyway, we went in the building and we said, because those of you that, I know most of you have been in arenas, if you've been to a Warriors game or football game or any of that kind of stuff, you know the stairs are just on and on and on. So we went in, I said, oh my goodness, is there an elevator? So one of the volunteers that showed us where an elevator was, he said there's one on each side of the building, but the one over there is the only one I know about. I don't know where the other one is. But if you walk around there, you'll find the elevator. We, we found the elevator. We got around there, my granddaughter going with me. The girlfriend, she says, well, I'll just go on ahead and find us a seat. And we want to sit on the main floor. We don't want to sit up all those stairs, right? So she found us a seat on the main floor, and she texted us, let us know where she found the seat so we could meet her. We get off the elevator, because there's only the two of us on the elevator, and the security guard standing there as we got off the elevator, he said, you can't come this way. It's a long walk. Okay, so we, uh, he said, but he saw my cane. He said, oh, come on, I'll take you. So he took us in to the building. We were on the main floor. We found our friend Deborah, got our seats. And this nice gentleman who was also working in the conference, and he showed me the seat and all. We sat down. And I sometimes, when I sit for a long time with my feet flat on the floor, sitting like you're sitting in your chairs, sometimes my foot will feel like it's, it's going dead or throbbing like a toothache or something. So if I sit with my foot up, it's much better. So the chair in front of me was empty, so I put my foot up on it. And the gentleman that saw me doing that, he walked over to me. And I thought he was going to tell me to take my foot down. And I says, oh, you need me to take my foot down? He said, oh, no. He said, do you need to have your foot up? I said, well, I don't have to, but it's much better if I do. That man went and got a sign and put on that chair just so I could put my foot up. That's not it, that's not all. He said, take my phone number, and when you come in the morning, the next meeting was at 10 o'clock the next day, he said, call me, and I will meet you outside and bring you in. So we did. We got there the next morning, we called him, we met him. He walked us through all those hundreds of people standing in line into inside, took us to the perfect elevator where our seats was, so I only had to walk his body from here to the bathroom, to the elevator. That's how close our seats was. And the bathroom was right around the corner. Because at my age, I go to the bathroom often. So God had everything just set up. It was, that, that man was like an angel. So he had made reserve signs for my girlfriend and I and he put the reserve, gave us the reserve signs, he says, and he says, um, you coming back this afternoon? And we said, yes. So he pulled out some more reserve signs. He said, but how many people? I said, well, I don't know. My granddaughter's supposed to come back, but I'm not sure. So he gave us a handful of reserve signs. So we got reserve seats for the rest of that conference. Not only that, but the people sitting next to me, they said, can I have one? Can I have one? People behind us, can I have one? Can I? So all around us, the people got reserved seats, signs to put on their seats so when they leave and come back, they'd have a seat. I said, you know, God is so good. He will bless a thousand just to bless one. And that just happened last week. This is the kind of God we serve. Friday, you ever, you ever just say, well, I sure would like to have something sweet to eat, but there was nothing in my house. But, you know, if you get it, it's fine. If you don't get it, it's okay. Five minutes later, I go to the bank. I walk in the bank, and they've got a whole thing of donuts. <laughs> I say, God, you are so good to Dorothy Daniels. And all I do is pray. I want to encourage you, don't stop praying. Keep on praying, because there are five levels to prayer. I'm almost done. The first level is crisis. And as Christians, we always pray in a crisis, right? We always pray when something's happening to us. 
We pray for little things like uh, my son was on drugs. That was mainly my prayer, praying for my son to get off of drugs. That's a kind of selfish kind of prayer because you're only praying for you and yours. But an intercessor, the role of an intercessor is not to pray for ourselves, but to pray for others. And you know, the Bible said it is a sin not to pray. And we have missed the mark. That's what sin is, missing the mark. And God looks at it as missing our destiny when we neglect to pray. The second level of prayer is called maintenance. These are the things I've learned. And we're just maintaining, you know, we pray for our church. We, we no longer praying just for me and my children. Now I'm praying for my church, my community, praying for other things. But I'm just maintaining. I'm still carrying anger, bitterness, all that kind of stuff. And if you hit me, if you touch me wrong, I'm going to tear you off. But I'm praying. But I'm just maintaining. Then the third level is beginning of intercession. This is a good place to be. This is a gift of the Holy Spirit, and beginning of intercession is guided prayer. Everything flows out of intercession. In the book of Romans 8.26, it says, we know not how to pray as we ought to, but is it the Spirit? It's all about Spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches us how to pray, leads us into prayer. And this is where we found out that Jesus didn't just come to heal the sick, open the blinded eyes. His main mission and focus was intercession. In Luke 22, it tells us how Jesus prayed till sweats of blood dropped down. Hallelujah, show y'all. For us, for our sins. He prayed and got himself ready to go to the cross. And God said to me one day, he says, I need sacrifice. An intercessor's life is a life of sacrifice. Because God may send you anywhere to just to intercede. God might tell you not to eat for a week. And you must be obedient. God might tell you you just bought a brand new coat. Maybe you paid $1,000 for it, and God will tell you, give it to sister so-and-so. God will tell us things that we really don't want to do, but it's sacrificial. I remember God, once a year, God would give me a fast. Once a year, I'd have to keep that fast all year long. One year, God said, don't eat no meat at all, all year. So I didn't eat meat all year. One year, God said, I don't want you to wear nothing but dresses down to your ankles. For one year, no pants, no nothing, just dresses and skirts down to my ankles. For one year. One year, God said, I don't want you to do any shopping this year. Don't buy nothing for yourself all year. God said to me, I require sacrifice. Jesus was the ultimate Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice for us. And if we're going to live this Christian life, if we're going to be intercessors, if we're going to be people of prayer, if we want to see the hand of God move, we must give him sacrifice. And we don't know what the sacrifice is. He has to tell us, and all we got to do is be obedient. Amen? One year he says, don't eat for three days a week for one year, two years. Two years I didn't eat for three days a week. Sacrifice. This is what real mother did. This is what intercessors do. This is the life of an intercessor. And we don't go around bragging about it, telling people, oh, I do this, I do that. I'm telling you some stories just to encourage you today. Because God want to bless us far more than we've ever been blessed. God want to give us the desires of our heart, but are we giving him the desire of his heart? 
God don't want us wanting or needing for any good thing. He said, it is my pleasure to give unto you the kingdom. But we've got to trust him. I remember just a couple of years ago, I needed a new refrigerator. I needed a new microwave. But I didn't want to buy it because I wanted to get all of my appliances to match. You know how we are as women. So I wanted a refrigerator, microwave, oven, and a dishwasher because I wanted them all to match. I didn't need all those, but I want them to match. But I didn't have the money for that. Did I pray about it? No, I did not. I didn't tell God I wanted that. But God will bless. You don't have to tell him. He said, I'll give you the desires of your heart. It was just the desire of my heart. As I don't pray about those kind of things. I just try to give God a holy life. And my daughter, she said, Mom, you need a new refrigerator. Here, go get you a new refrigerator. She gave me a check for $1,000. And I thought to myself, <laughs> The refrigerator I got there was 2300 I can't buy a refrigerator for $1,000. So I put the money in the bank, and I just held on to it. And I said, well, thank you, Lord, for the money. I'll just save it till I get some more to go with it, and then I'll buy what I want. Before I could do that, I woke up one morning, and I heard this Holy Spirit say, go to Sears Outlet. I went to Sears Outlet, didn't find anything. Went back two or three times, but in the meantime, I went back two or three times. I met the manager. I met the people on the floor. And one day I got up and I said to the girl driving me, I said, I'm going to get my refrigerator today. We went there, and as soon as I walked in the door, there it was. And the man said to me, I can't sell it to you because a customer came in earlier today and we promised it to them. And I said, but I was here three days ago and the manager told me that they don't save stuff for the customers because I wanted her to save one for me. He said, and she told me you don't do that. So he said, well, the customer came in and I promised her. So I went to the manager and I said, did you tell me you don't save? So I got the refrigerator. In the meantime, my friend the manager had told us, if you go look at the queue on the, on the, you know, the sale paper, you know, the stickers that be on them, if you put that number in and look it up, you can get them much cheaper. And if you find it cheaper, they'll sell it to you cheaper. So when we, every, every time we'd go, we'd look for it cheaper. But today, this refrigerator was everything I wanted for $5,040. I mean, $500. $540. And so I went to purchase it, but the man didn't want me to purchase it. So I went and got the manager and purchased it anyway. That day, the girl that was with me, she's still looking it up to get it cheaper. I said, I, I can't get this any cheaper. They found out that the cue card on uh, the skew on the refrigerator was actually for a garbage disposal. They put the wrong price on the refrigerator. But being obedient to the Holy Spirit, I bought it right when he told me to buy it. By the time they found out the wrong price was on it, I already purchased it. For 400 for 540 dollars. Everything in the store that day was on sale, 20 percent off. So I actually got a three thousand dollar refrigerator for 400 and some dollars. Not only that, but they had the dishwasher I needed. I got that. As it turned out, I got all four appliances, the dishwasher, the microwave, the refrigerator, and the oven for less than $1,000. God wants to give us the desire of our heart. But do we want to give him the desire of his heart? These are just two or three little stories I've told you, but this is my life. God does not want us wanting for any good thing. He's well able and willing, and he wants to do for us much more than we realize. 
So I got my refrigerator and I got all the stuff and God is still blessing. But the fifth level of prayer is intercession. It's not a gift. It is a calling for every Christian that has been born again. It is the foundation of all Christian ministry. And our first ministry is to intercession. Out of intercession births all the other ministries. What does intercession do? It secures healing, James 5, 14. It averts judgment, find that in the book of Numbers. It ensures deliverance, Sabbath. Isaiah 66 and 7. This is where the rest of God is that Hebrew 4 talks about. Talks about resting in the Lord. This is where you could be going through all kind of stuff, but you could still rest in the Lord. This is where the power is received. Not underestimating the word. We need the word of God. Knowing the word with intimacy is the most powerful thing you can have. This is where we become impregnated with new vision, new inspiration, new anointing, and in time, we give birth to what God wants us to give birth to. God bless you, Father God. 
in the name of Jesus. Let us not continue to say all we do is pray. Father, draw us nearer to you. We just want to know you better, Lord. We just want to please you, Lord God. Father, touch our hearts today. Touch our minds and change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Sister Dorothy. We are going to pray for Sister Dorothy and her ministry. We are going to take a minute. Can we do that? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the woman of God that you sent in our midst, O oh God. Lord, thank you for this life of intercession, the life of pouring out. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the woman of God, like Anna in the scripture. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we praise you for the mighty woman of God that you have placed in our midst, O oh Lord. We pray for her good health. We pray, Father, that your mighty hand will be upon her. Lord, we pray for international new wave ministries. Let it go all over the world, touching the multitudes, O oh God. We pray that you will meet all the need need for people, need for provision, need for open doors according to your perfect will. We commit their ministry into your hands, O oh Lord. Lord, thank you for the privilege that we have to have her as one among us here in the Potter's Ministries and in this church today, Lord. We thank you and we praise you. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Please spend a few minutes in the presence of the Lord wherever you are and ask the Lord to write those words in the tablets of your heart and commit your lives to the Lord the best you know how. May God bless you. See you next week. Thank you. <laughs>